Well, hi everybody, it's Mr. Schauber for part one of our baseball presentation. In this presentation, we'll look at the dead ball era, which is really the beginnings of modern baseball. Baseball has been called the American pastime, and for many, many years, it was the number one sport in the United States. It was the sport that pretty much everybody knew something about. And uh, even people who weren't big sports fans knew the teams, knew some of the star players. Uh, it was just the game that Americans followed the most. How did baseball start? Well, like I've written on here, that question has been debated for a long time and nobody knows exactly how it was born. Of course, it was uh, probably influenced by games that had, had been developed before it, like cricket or rounders, which came from England. Um, some people think it's, it's a completely an, an American invention. I, I'm not sure, but like I said, either way, I think it's the greatest game ever invented. It's my favorite sport. I love baseball every spring when the grass starts to get green and, and uh, there's that crisp spring air. Uh, it just smells like baseball to me. So you can see early forms of baseball had a variety of names, including base ball, goal ball, round ball, stool ball, and simply base. In at least one version of the game, teams pitched to themselves. Runners went around the bases in the opposite direction of today's game. And players could get, quote unquote, out by being hit with the ball. Of course, none of those things exist anymore, but that's how it used to be. There is documentation of the above mentioned games being played during the Revolutionary War times in, in the United States. Uh, and baseball, much like we know it today, was played by Civil War soldiers when they weren't actually fighting. The man generally credited with inventing modern baseball is Alexander Cartwright, who authored the first published rules of baseball in 1845. And uh, he also umpired the first ever recorded U.S. baseball game with codified or set rules. That game took place on June 19th, 1846 in Hoboken, New Jersey. And of course, since that day, baseball has evolved like every other sport uh, evolves with better equipment and some new rules and changes in rules and, and different, out, uh, different layouts of stadiums and things like that. But baseball itself is still uh, America's game. I believe. There you can see some pictures of Alexander Cartwright. And uh, yes, he is the man credited with inventing, quote unquote, baseball. So the dead ball era, what was that whole thing about? Well, it's the period between 1900 and 1919. They call it the dead ball era for multiple reasons, which we'll talk about in just a second. But you can see that games tended to be low scoring or often dominated by pitchers such as Walter Johnson, Cy Young, Christy Matheson, Mordecai Brown, and Grover Cleveland Alexander. We'll look at a few of those in just a minute. Uh, the term dead ball also accurately describes the condition of the baseball itself. The ball was basically softer than it is today. Um, it was made of yarn that was wound loosely uh, around the, the, the center of, of the ball, and it, that obviously limited the distance that the ball would travel. A baseball cost $3 back then, equal to $40.39 today. Uh, so baseballs were very expensive. Oftentimes, if a ball went into the stands, it was expected that the ball would be thrown back and, and continued to to, to be used. Um, if a ball got dirty, if a ball got wet, it didn't matter. They still used the same ball during the game. Today, it's uh, estimated that in an average Major League Baseball game, they go through 12 dozen or about 144 baseballs per game. If the ball uh, hits the ground between the pitcher and the catcher, you know, the ball gets, hits the dirt before it gets to the, the plate. Uh, or at the plate, they throw it out and they'll probably, you know, they use it for the next day's batting practice. Um, 
you know, anything today that would scuff up a ball at all, they throw it out. But back then, they used, they tried to use the ball as long as they could. Um, also, pitchers could manipulate the ball through the use of the spitball. In 1921, use of this pitch was restricted to just a few pitchers who had used it prior, but it was outlawed for all new pitchers. Also, during the dead ball era, many ballparks were huge, such as you can see the west side grounds of the Chicago Cubs before they moved into Wrigley Field, which was 560 feet to center field, and the Huntington Avenue grounds of the Boston Red Sox before they moved into Fenway Park, which was 635 feet to center field fence. So home runs were rare. Small ball was used. So by small ball, we mean singles and, and bunts, stolen bases, hit, hit and runs. Uh, those types of strategies dominated baseball in the dead ball era because it was rare that a guy would hit a home run, especially over a fence. Most home runs where you hit the ball between the fielders and you just circle the bases. So the dead ball era is called that for obvious reasons. Now to the players. Let's talk about a few of the players most famous during the dead ball era, starting with Cap Hansen. You can see he played 27 consecutive seasons, which is a record. He's one of the game's first superstars, first player to collect 3,000 career hits. He's still seventh all-time in hits. You can see he's fourth all-time in RBI, runs batted in with 2,075, and he's ninth all-time in runs scored with 1,999. His lifetime average was 334, which is phenomenal. And uh, I just love these old pictures as well, because you can see the uniforms, uh, kind of the lace up, uh, and and then then when they went to the button up tops, uh, the collars that the tops used to have, great stuff. But um, Cap Anson was one of baseball's first superstars, no doubt, and his career stats have has, have withheld the test of time. Cy Young is widely regarded as one of the great pitchers of all time, and you can see. His statistics uh, definitely reflect that. He helped the Red Sox win the first modern World Series in 1903. He played for numerous teams, uh, but uh, but probably most famously for the Boston, uh, well, you can see Boston Americans, lower left picture, B.A., Boston Americans, who, who became the Red Sox. During his career, he pitched three no-hitters in one perfect game. And, uh, of course, the Cy Young Award today given to the best pitcher or the pitcher voted to be the best pitcher for that season in the American League and the National League uh, gets the Cy Young Award. You can see his records, which, you know, they say records are made to be broken, but his records will probably never be touched because he pitched for so long. And when he pitched during this dead ball era and, and just out of the dead ball era as well when pitchers were going, they were expected, if they started a game, to finish the game. You didn't have a lot of relief pitchers. Uh, you you got the ball in the first inning, and you were expected to go nine innings. And if the game went extra innings, oftentimes you continued on in, into extra innings. So 511 wins, 316 losses. You can see that's 827 decisions. And it's just, it's not going to happen that a pitcher these days we'll, we'll get the, those numbers because first of all uh, in the dead ball era as well pitchers didn't have uh, four or or five days in between starts they would pitch every second or third day sometimes and so you, you had a lot more games that you pitched in and of course because you went deeper into games you had more decisions you can see his innings pitched that will never be touched uh, is 749 complete games. Unbelievable. So, and I mean, a record that could conceivably be reached and broken, but is just phenomenal. 25 and a third consecutive hitless innings pitched. He did not give up a hit for almost three, three games in a row. So uh, incredible. The Flying Dutchman, they call him, even though he was of German heritage. Uh, 
Honus Wagner, considered by many to be the greatest shortstop of all time, uh, starred for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He won eight batting titles, so he led the league in batting average eight years. Uh, he led the league in slugging percentage six times and in stolen bases five times. A tremendous fielder, and you can see obviously a tremendous hitter, the ultimate combination of average with power with speed, uh, 327 lifetime average, eighth all-time in career hits with 3,420, uh, 1,732 RBI, 1,739 runs scored, and a lot of stolen bases. He helped the Pirates win the 1909 World Series, and he was uh, elected into the Hall of Fame in 1936 when it first opened as one of the first five members in that first class of the Hall of Fame. Uh, Honus Wagner these days uh, may be as, as famous for his baseball card as he is for his playing ability. Uh, and you can see that they call it the, the Honus Wagner T206. Baseball cards used to come in uh, by, made by tobacco companies. And, uh, of course, there are very few of these baseball cards around today. These cards that are 100 years old or more, um, not many of them have survived uh, the test of time. And so, uh, but Honus Wagner, his card, because he was a star and because there are so few of them, uh, is probably the most famous baseball card in history because uh, it, it also has sold for the most money. You can see in 2011 at auction, one of the very few remaining Honus Wagner T206 cards sold for $2.8 million. Incredible. But Honus Wagner was the ultimate as far as a player went. Christy Mathewson, the Christian gentleman, pitched mostly for the New York Giants. Uh, helped the Giants win a World Series in 1905, considered to be uh, one of the ultimate nice guys in the game. He was every little boy's hero in the early 1900s. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, in that first class in 1936. Uh, he, you can see, ranks still in the top 10 all-time in wins, shutouts, and ERA. He holds the National League record for wins with 373, and that will probably never be broken. And Cy Young had 511. Uh, Matthewson with 373 will probably never be broken either. He also uh, served in World War I after he retired from baseball, and that really did a number on him on a personal level, and he was never the same after... Uh, after his service in World War I. But while he was pitching, he was a superstar. And like I said, he was uh, he was the hero uh, for so many little kids that looked up to him and wanted to be baseball players themselves. Ty Cobb, the Georgia Peach, also one of the first five players voted into the Hall of Fame in 1936. He got the most votes uh, of any of those five. He is one of the most dominant offensive players in history. He is one of the most ornery and polarizing players in history. But Ty Cobb was the ultimate competitor. You can see he's widely credited with setting 90 Major League Baseball records during his career. His 367 career batting average is still the highest all time. He won 12 batting titles, which is most all-time, including nine in a row, which is a record. He batted over 400 three times, which is a record. He stole home 54 times, including eight in one season, which are both records. You can see he's second all-time in runs scored, uh, next only to uh, Ricky Henderson, and his 4,191 career hits are second all-time next only to Pete Rose. He's still ninth all-time in career RBI. And, you know, you can see he's named to the Major League Baseball All-Century team. Uh, he did serve briefly in World War I uh, as well. 
And uh, but like I said, he's also known for his temperament. Even players on his own team sometimes uh, disliked him. He would he would slide with his spikes up, trying to break up double plays uh, or going into bases. He was he was just uh, <laughs> he was not loved by opposing players, and like I said, not oftentimes by his own teammates. But uh, he was without a doubt one of the greatest baseball players of all time, and, and that includes the players going today. Tris Speaker, the Gray Eagle, one of the great offensive and defensive uh, outfielders in history. You can see he's sixth all-time with a 345 career batting average. He's fifth all-time in career hits. He has a record for uh, career doubles with 792. He won three World Series with two different teams. He won uh, two with the Red Sox and one with the, the uh, Cleveland Indians. And he holds the Major League record for assists, double plays, and unassisted double plays by an outfielder. And those records may never be broken either. Uh, he, he was known, uh, his center field position was known as the place where triples go to die because guys would hit the ball in the gap thinking that ball's going to get down, and they got a triple, and the Gray Eagle would go over and take that triple away, catch the ball, and record it out. He was unbelievable. Uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame in the second class in 1937 and named to the Major League Baseball All Century team himself. Tris Speaker, truly one of the greats. Speaking of greats, the big train, Walter Johnson. All-time leader in shutouts, 110 games he started and finished and did not allow a run by the opposing team. Uh, again, I think that's a record that will probably not be broken because most guys don't pitch complete games anymore. So to have 110 shutouts, not just complete games, but shutouts, that's just almost unbelievable. 417 career wins. He's second all-time next to Cy Young. And still way behind Cy Young. That tells you how far Cy Young is out ahead of everybody. But Walter Johnson with 417 wins. Wow. And 531 complete games. You can see he led the league in strikeouts a record 12 times, including eight seasons in a row. A 2.17 career ERA, over 3,500 strikeouts, a record he held for many years in Major League Baseball. Uh, Two-time MVP of the league. And he helped the uh, Washington Senators win the World Series in 1924. It wasn't until 2019 that another Washington team won the World Series with the Washington Nationals capturing the title. You can see he had 12 20-win seasons and two 30-win seasons. That's just unbelievable, and led the American League in wins six times and ERA five times. And in, in uh, three seasons, he won the triple crown, the pitching triple crown, which is where a pitcher leads the league in wins, strikeouts, and ERA in the same season. He was in that first class uh, of the Hall of Fame in 1936, and uh, he was voted to baseball's all-century and all-time teams. He was known as throwing probably harder than just about anybody during his era. And, uh, you know, by today's standards, people disagree because their radar uh, to detect pitching speed wasn't really a thing. So, uh, so we just can only guess how hard he threw. But some people think he was anywhere from the... 94 to 95 mile an hour range up to the 98 to 99, maybe 100 miles an hour, depending on who you talk to. But regardless, he is known as uh, not only one of the hardest throwing pitchers for his era of all time, but he is known as one of the greats ever. Shoeless Joe Jackson. Shoeless. Why do they call him shoeless? Because the legend goes that one day in the minor leagues, his shoes, he got a new pair of spikes. They were uncomfortable, so he took them off and he ran around in the outfield in just his socks. Well, 
However, he got his nickname, it stuck. And Joe Jackson is one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Unfortunately, he's probably best known for his alleged involvement in the what's called the Black Sox scandal in 1919 World Series. Uh, he and seven of his teammates were indicted and ultimately banned for life from baseball for having bet on uh, or basically intentionally thrown the World Series in 1919. He claims he was uh, never a part of that, but uh, historical records um, seem to show that he must have known something about it and uh, whether he actually actively participated in it is still up for some debate. He did hit the the only home run in that World Series. He had a good batting average. Uh, he, he didn't look like he was trying to throw the series, but uh, he was included in that in those eight guys that were ultimately banned from baseball. Uh, Babe Ruth said he modeled his hitting after Joe Jackson. He's still third all-time in career batting average with a 356 lifetime clip. He hit 408 as a rookie which is a rookie record. He helped the White Sox win the 1917 World Series. And then in 1919, when they went back, uh, it's known as the Black Sox scandal because of just the, the, the black eye it put on baseball. Um, but he was also a tremendous outfielder, great range, great arm. He was, in many ways, kind of the perfect baseball player. And uh, a lot of ball players during his era, looked up to him and modeled their game after him. He grew up really poor, unlearned, illiterate, in fact, uh, in South Carolina. And because he was illiterate, he would have his wife sign his name to things, or he would simply make an X for his signature. And uh, a lot of people think due to his being uneducated and just kind of a nice guy that he was, naive perhaps, that he was roped into this scandal. So wherever the truth is in this Black Sox scandal, unfortunately it brought down one of the game's greats with Joe Jackson.